I'm very excited to have David Avocado Wolf with us today. He is a nutritionist, a superfoodist, an orator, a herbalist, a chocolatier, and an organic farmer. You've probably heard his name before, but if you haven't, he's a huge name on social media. He's got a massive following, following with millions, like at least 12 million followers on some of his uh, social platforms. He's a rock star and Indiana Jones of the Superfoods and Longevity universe. His Facebook page, Facebook videos, and posts reach millions of people each week around the world with succinct, powerful, inspirational quotes, news, health information, and education with 25-plus years of dedicated experience and having hosted 3,000 live health events. David has led the environmental charge for radiant health via positive mental attitude, eco-community building, lives, living spring water, and the best ever quality organic foods, wild foods, juices, and herbs. David is also the founder and president of the nonprofit, the Fruit Tree Planting uh, Foundation, FTPF, ftpf.org, which, which has a mission to plant 18 billion fruit, nut, and medicinal trees on earth. What an amazing mission. <laughs> great great to uh, have you, you on the show. Thank you for being here, David. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, so you're... I guess it, it, go ahead. <laughs> I was just, it starts with for me with farming, and I'm back in Southern California right now just for a brief little stay, and this is where it all started for me in 1978, growing citrus and avocado trees, and um, it's just, it's amazing the quality of sunlight here in Southern California for citrus fruit and avocados in particular. Yeah, There's so you're, you're big into it. avocados. It's actually in your name <laughs> because uh, uh, why? Do you want to share the, the story behind that? Well, I, I came to Southern California from New York when I, in uh, the mid 70s, you know, coming with my uncle. My uncle had moved out here and uh, my uncle, interestingly, worked for a fast food restaurant chain. He was the head of food maker for Jack in the Box restaurants. Okay. And so they moved him from St. Louis out to San Diego where food maker was located. And um, he bought a, a ranch out in East San Diego. So we came out here with him in 1977 and we started planting citrus. And then in 1978, that summer was the first summer of planting avocados. And that's where it started for me. Oh, that's awesome. And what is your favorite avocado? Is it the Haas? My favorite avocado. No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I love Haas avocados, and, and I love avocados of all types. Um, even the watery and wet ones and stringy ones that people hate, I still can find some redeeming value in those. Um, but I, my favorite are the Guatemalan Highland avocados, the big globe, oily avocados that have that wonderful flavor that we like from Haas avocados, because we like the oily avocados, but even better and more. Yeah, so if if you were to advise our listener to go to a particular uh, grocery store and get a particular type of, of avocado, what would it be? Like, can you just go to Whole Foods and get uh, the Reed avocado, or do you have to go somewhere special to get it? And, and is Reed the one that you would recommend or something else? I, I like Reed's. Reed's are a good example of a Highland Guatemalan avocado. They really are. They're, they're fascinating because they're big and they're really oily and delicious. So that's the one to look for, or sometimes they call them cannonball avocados. But outside of the outside of the reach of Southern California, they're hard to find. And uh, so you may, you, I don't know, I'd ask. You might want to ask your, your health food store, grocery store, wherever you shop at, and just say, hey, can you get more different kinds of avocados? Sometimes they can. And, and it's good to, to expand your avocado palate. You know, I only recently in the, my 40s started uh, eating avocados. I, I missed out my whole adult life and, and childhood for, uh, for the most part, but now I'm, I'm making up for it uh, uh, these days. I make these avocado shakes that have, um, uh, of course, they're organ or, or everything's organic. Organic avocado, uh, organic um, spinach, and uh Persian uh, cucumbers and um, half a lemon peeled and um, uh, almond milk. And I think that's about it. I mean, you can add a little stevia to sweeten it, but I don't. And it's great. It's it's tastes delicious. It's healthy and um, yeah, good stuff. So uh, I, I recommend that. Um, uh, a little disclaimer here. That's not medical advice or anything. None of this is medical advice. Consult your doctor. Uh, all standard disclaimers apply. But um, I've found it's really rejuvenating and, and reinvigorating for myself personally. 
Epic. Awesome. Yeah, I, I love those kind of little formulas. I mean, I'm still, you know, a guacamole addict after all these years. Uh-huh. And um, yesterday, pretty much only guacamole all day. So I'm still, you know, I do like to use a little avocado in my smoothies, but more, I'm more still a guacamole person. Okay. And, you know, and, what, and do you, what are, do you have chips with food. that? I mean, no, it, yesterday I had mostly, what did I have with that? I had my mom made, made me guacamole. I went to her house and we had guacamole with eggplant, which my mom loves eggplant, you know, okay. Persian cooking. And um, what else we had? We had peppers and cucumbers and vegetables to dip in. Okay. Because isn't and, it and, true that if you fry uh, chips, like uh, tortilla chips and, and oil, and uh, you're kind of <laughs> taking all the goodness away from having the healthy avocado with that unhealthy uh, fried fats with it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to be careful the oils they're using. And canola oil is one we've talked about before that is it sneaks in. And uh, definitely one to watch out for because it's too high in omega six. It's you know you're going to end up getting twenty times the omega six than you need, and so just be careful with with that. I would go for more, I guess, not cooked in oil but baked if you're going to eat chips. Yeah. Um, but there's so many great raw food crackers out there How these days. Be an example of one. Well, I like Lydia's crackers. Lydia's crackers are available on most of the western side of America, in you know major health food store chains. And um, my favorite is the Luna Nori cracker that she makes. It's it's got a little bit of seaweed in it and almond uh, almond flour, and just it's just delicious, you know. And and not cooked in oil. It's one of those products that has like free of every see that list of like no sugar, no GMO, no um, chemicals, no you know all those things. It's really hilarious what it's come to. But I've known Lydia for twenty years, and she's a stickler for quality. So that's my favorite personal raw cracker. Oh, that's awesome. And and uh, let's talk about oils for a minute because there's avocado oil. That's a good healthy oil uh, depending on how it's been processed, uh, uh, my understanding at least. And um, coconut oil is better for cooking than, say, um, olive oil. I learned that uh, from several people, but I just uh, talked with Dr. Anthony Jay, who's the author of... Um, uh, it's estro, uh, estro generation is the name of the book. Yeah, that's are it. You, that's are you familiar right. with that book? Well, my cousin has it over here on the shelf. So I'm, I was looking at it the other day. I was like, I should grab that. I ended up grabbing like five other books, but that one was nagging at me. So I'll take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. So I interviewed him and we talked about all sorts of, uh, fun stuff, uh, including activated charcoal. And I know you're a fan of that. So do you want to say something about activated charcoal while we're on it? Of all things, you know, I, I kind of realized some years ago of like, we're going to have to, we're, we're not going to be protected by our government, obviously, from the chemicals that are being thrown on us, you know, and our like glyphosate, look what happened with that and DDT and all this other stuff. Yeah. So eventually I realized, okay, what, what can we do to empower people that, that really is an effective detoxifier that has, you know, such, such a long history of, of use? Well, as I started digging into activated charcoal, I was astounded by what I found out, literally astounded. Activated charcoal is the number one longevity substance in animal research ever discovered. And that's a really profound statement, meaning that like olive oil is a, is a known longevity substance. In animals, it typically extends life by 9 to 18% and humans too, which is very high and very unusual. You're not going to beat that with like resveratrol. I love resveratrol. I think it's an amazing and interesting um color pigment. Actually, it's a yellow color pigment, um, but mostly hard to absorb. And in, in research, you're lucky if you get a 7% increase in lifespan with resveratrol. Olive oil, 9 to 18%. That's profound. But with activated charcoal, you're hitting numbers of 21% up to 47% increase in lifespan. Hmm. Now, just to put that in a context, because if I say some percentage, people go like, what does that mean? Um, it means this. It basically, you know, if you're if we had lived naturally, normally, we had no industry, and we had you know proper diet and everything, we get a hundred years. That's what I think is really the natural lifespan of a human being in a perfect situation. So if you were to able to extend the lifespan of a human being by twenty one percent, which activated charcoal is known to do in animals consistently, that's a hundred and twenty one years. Let's say thirty percent, which is very common again in animal research. Frolkus, the Russian gerontologist. He was extending lifespan consistently of animals by 34%, which is 
with activated charcoal, even as high as 41%, even 43% in his research, and another research even got to 47%, um, that means 134 years to a human being, you know, in terms of the corollary. Yeah. I'm, well, I, I've had uh, Dave Asprey on the show, and he wants to live to, or he plans to live to 180. And uh, also Nick Delgado uh, plans to live to 180, too. He, he was also on the show. Uh, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. I, I, know, I know both of them, actually. Yeah. I went to school. This is crazy, but I, I actually went to school with Dave Asprey. Okay. And we knew each other in college. And what was interesting about that, he lived in the same building as me. We didn't have the same class together, but we met in the building. And he was a real, he's, he's a um, serial entrepreneur is probably the best way to describe him. Yeah. He, you know, so he was always trying to sell me something. And, he, and I remember buying some Halloween shirts from him. But I didn't put the, it all together until one day I was interviewing him. And he said, I said, so Dave, where are you from? He's like, oh, I went to school in Santa Barbara. I was like, where? Next thing I know, he pulls out a picture of what he looked like back then because he was 100 pounds overweight. I think you have a similar story. Right. Well, um, I, I, well and, and I, I wasn't that overweight. I was just really old looking. <laughs> I looked 20 years older than, and, and this was a decade ago, if you look at the photos. And, and uh, listeners, if you're interested and <laughs> you haven't seen the before photo, go to my about page on getyourselfoptimized.com. That you, your jaw will drop, I guarantee it. So yeah, I looked 20 years older than I do now, and that was a decade ago pretty wild that's a good job that's <laughs> what dave asprey did he reversed age himself he looked terrible in college i mean but he was on junk food and stuff right. um and he when was I suffering from like, toxic oh, mold exposure you. right yeah absolutely and but i remembered him you know it was like oh i remember you i remember you know so it was interesting how long we've known each other that's and, funny and, Small and this is interesting how yeah how things you know cross over the 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 uh, interactions that we have with people over the years fascinating yeah yeah well there are no coincidences i, I believe that uh, now, you mentioned omega-6 when you were talking about uh, things like canola oil having way too much omega-6, and there needs to be a balance in terms of omega-3 to omega-6 to omega-9s. Um, I actually talked a lot about this in an episode with Udo Erasmus. Do you know who Udo is? The Udo's Old oil? friends. That's another another amazing you know, yeah. synchronous life. Though. I've known Udo for 20 years, over 20 years. I would probably have years. like I, I, like a huge who's who list of my past guests. You're like, oh yeah, that good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, I've known him for 20 years. Oh yeah, I've known her for 20 uh, years. Um, how about JJ Virgin? I know JJ Virgin very well as yeah. as well. Yeah, um, we had a great pretty episode, much all of them. I mean, conversation about sugar. Uh, that was that was awesome. So oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've been at this 25 years, so you can imagine over the years, you know, you cross paths with a lot of a lot of the characters in this field which is a really exciting and fun field. Um, not exactly what the establishment wants, um, <laughs> but, but, but our powers are increasing and improving because more and more people are realizing the sense of it, right? It just makes a lot of sense. It's like, hey, yeah, we'd rather have food that doesn't have chemicals on it than food that does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so uh, this idea of getting more omega-3s than your omega-6s, why is that important and to what degree do we need to get more of the omega-3s? Great question. Okay, so the omega-3s and the omega-6s have to do with cell membranes, which if we're paying attention to Bruce Lipton's work, has a lot to do with the um, intelligence of the cell. And and the and intelligence in general, you know, our skin is a very is like the corollary, right? And our skin actually emerges in, in the embryonic state out of our nervous system, and the skin is an extension of our nervous system. And that's that's how we can think about cells: is that the cell membrane is an extension of the nervous system to some degree. Now, if you have too much omega six, the gum, the cell turns into gummy; it becomes gummy or gluey, and the information, nutrients, and especially um, sugar can't get into the cell, so it starts bouncing, and that's when we get hypoglycemia, and that can cascade dangerously into a, a syndrome, not really a disease, but a syndrome that we call diabetes type 2, yeah. which has a lot to do with too much omega-6. Not entirely do, but a lot to do, because the sugar can't get into the cell because the cell is so gummed up. What we have to do is we have to get the omega-3 in, and we also have to get better quality oil so that if we have omega-6, it's not rancid, because Canola oil, for example, with the processing, the cooking, the heating, not, not only are we getting too much omega-6, but it's rancid omega-6. Yeah, and it's, so, uh, it's like essentially uh, it's been uh, like bleached and uh, drainoed, that oil to make it all <laughs> like pretty and, and uh, pristine and easy to see through and stuff. So unhealthy. We, we, it's the worst. 
It's the worst. So just be on the lookout for canola oil. My, my assistant will not allow me to have anything in my body that has any canola oil in it whatsoever as any ingredient at any level ever. So I have watchdogs like that. And that's always good to have someone watching for you like that. I eat mostly raw foods anyway, so it's never really an issue. But, you know, like if we're at Whole Foods and we're, you know, getting some, I don't know, some dish that's already pre-made, you know, like a, like a pre-made salad with oil on it. And it turns out that the salad dressing had canola oil in it. It's like, whoa, can't have it. Right. Anyway, I also noticed that at uh, Whole Foods and a lot of, uh, these, these food bars at healthy quote unquote places is that a lot of the food's not even organic. So you'll get, oh, all right. So the, the, spinach or or the lettuce that's organic but then the tomatoes aren't or the uh the beets aren't like that's not good (laughs) it's not i mean it's it's crazy i don't know we you know this is so that's kind of the dark side of the capitalistic system is that you know in order for capitalism to really work you need education otherwise it's all going to be made you know somewhere cheap and there's going to be a lot of uh, corners cut yeah. Um, and that brings me really to the next issue, which we should really talk about, which is omega-3 fatty acids and, and how important they are, but how much quality concerns we have there as well. I really recommend hemp seed oil for ALA. There's really three omega-3s. You really need three of them, okay. DHA, ALA, and EPA. ALA is terrestrial. It comes from seeds like chia seed, flax seed, hemp seed. And the oil is important, by the way, because people say, no, no, I'm getting enough from my food. But I've known people who got into raging omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies who ate omega-3 rich foods every day but didn't get the oil. Oh, right. I learned about this, that like if you get flax seed oil or you put chia seeds in, on your whatever uh, salads, that the the oil is trapped inside the seeds so you got to break the seeds open to get to the oil so you get this um like a coffee grinder you put your flax seeds in there grind up the flax so that it opens up the oil for you and then that goes into your smoothie or whatever yeah that's a much better way to guarantee you're going to get the oil because you could eat those foods but a lot of them would go through you because they didn't actually you didn't crack the shell of the chia seed or the flax seed so omega-3 has three of them it's there's a terrestrial one and two marine in origin so we might have gotten confused about that we're like wait a second what about fish oil versus hemp seed oil well you actually need both but obviously i'm a ve- i'm a vegetarian i don't eat fish so what do i do i go to algae because that's where the fish get it from. The, the algae is the basis of the whole food chain anyway, especially the phytoplankton, chlorophyll-rich algae, some of the highest protein food in the world. That's why whales eat it. And also rich in omega-3. Many are rich in DHA and or EPA. And so through that, we can get the real kind of fish oil, but more from the source. And much, I think, to me, my mind is more ethical, right? You can grow algae, get your omega-3 fatty acids and you don't have any, you know, no worries about plastic in the ocean or mercury or whatever else is going on. Yeah. So there's a, um, a brand of, uh, these oils, like if they have fish oils, they have, if you're, uh, let's say pescatarian, you eat fish, but you don't eat meat, then you can get Nordic naturals with the, instead of the capsules being made with, uh, with animal, uh, like, uh, beef, uh, gelatin, it could be made with fish gelatin, but they also have the algae kind of if you're, if you're vegetarian and not pescatarian. So you can get your, uh, your, your omega threes that way. So what, what do you think of Nordic naturals as a brand? Is that pretty good? I, I've stopped, <laughs> I stopped, um, promoting brands that I don't really know the story behind it because okay. I've been burned so many times. Um, yeah, because you almost so have I, to like go inspect their facilities. Yeah, and, look at and their, I have inspected uh, some or... facilities. Um, there's a there's a cod liver oil operation in Iceland called Dropi D R O P I, where I have inspected their facility, and they're they're a world class operation. They're a cool operation. So, okay. I unless I've inspected their facility, I can't say. And I've been burned a few times because I was like, yeah, it seems like a good brand. Then I found out it wasn't, or whatever. You know, right, right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, alternatives to canola oil that you recommend, like avocado oil and uh, yeah, well, well, olive oil. Olive you know, oil. You're better off. Yeah, it, just, if you want something straight down the middle, tried and true, known longevity substance, 
go for a good quality olive oil. I have a few that I recommend. You know, my, my friends in Crete and Greece um, have their brands. And then there's a good one in California, too, the Bariani olive oil in California, Acropolis olive oil in Crete, and then uh, um, Rallis olive oil out of the Peloponnesus region of, uh, of Greece. Okay. Well, those are some of my favorites. Not the only good ones. There's many good ones, but those are ones that I like, and I have seen their facilities, and I know exactly what they're doing, so I'm very happy with those brands. Great. Now, I would be remiss to not ask you about vinegar then, uh, to yeah, have, have that oil and vinegar uh, on your salad. So what kind of vinegars would you recommend? Does it matter if it's apple cider vinegar or white vinegar or whatever? Uh, and then what are some brands that you are familiar with? Well, one thing I do is we make our own vinegar because on my farm, we also have apple trees. So I have a farm in Ontario, Canada. I have a farm in Hawaii. And uh, we so we do make apple cider vinegar at home. I like Bragg's apple cider vinegar as a go-to that's easy. I'm a big fan of Patricia. I've known Patricia for 25 years. She's, she's still going. She's the heir of the, of the Bragg empire. And uh, Paul Bragg was, was very, very close with a dear friend of mine. And, um, that's once we can do that story one day on what really happened to Paul Bragg. He did not die in a surfing accident. Actually. Um, he went, he went in another way, which, which we should do a show on because Paul Bragg was, you know, he was the Jack LaLanne of his time. He was the, um, he was the guru in California of health and he lived in 94. Very amazing guy. But his, his apple cider vinegar is really good. Acropolis olive oil, those guys in Crete, they have a 4,000 year old olive tree on their farm, by the way, made one of the oldest olive trees in the world, maybe the oldest. Wow. Yeah, it's a neat thing to see. And they also they have a balsamic vinegar that I really like. It's my favorite. So That's it just cool. depends on what you're into. If you really want the classic old European balsamic Italian style or Greek style, then you know go with Acropolis or some Italian brand that you like. If you like just the straight up apple cider vinegar, Bragg I think is a really good one. It's just it's straight down the middle. The white vinegars are a little too refined for my taste. I don't like them. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. All right, now uh, I want to circle back on on something, a couple things that you said earlier. One was. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Bruce Lipton. So what is it about Bruce Lipton's research or his uh, uh, his recommendations that you most want our listener to, to get from, from this interview? What I love about Bruce and, and another good friend of mine, Bruce Lipton, and, and what I love about what he's done with his books and his research is he vindicated Lamarck and Lamarckism. Lamarck was an epigeneticist from the t basically from the French Revolution time back in, back then, and he was slandered and thrown under the bus. And then later he was vindicated because it turns out even for the last forty years, even definitely in the last thirty, but really in science, it's been the last forty years, genetics is not really what it's about. It's about epigenetics, which means that you have your genetic code, and based on epigenetic triggers, sunlight, happiness. Um, food quality, types of food you're eating, nutrients, et cetera, certain you know, unique molecules. You can flip on genetics that are good for you or you can flip on genetics that are bad for you. And so that's called upregulation or downregulation. And you want to upregulate all the good genes. And so the, the doomsday reports that we got, like, oh, you know, you've got these genes that you're done for, really didn't pan out. That turned out to be a false worldview. And Lamarck was vindicated. He was an epigeneticist, and, and that, that is just a standard in science now. It's nobody really believes in, at that level of research that genetics is a death sentence. It's just, you ha it's just what you've got, and then you're going to try to flip on all the good stuff and turn off the bad stuff by lifestyle, essentially, and also the way you think, and also where you position yourself spiritually, too, has a big effect. Right. right? So it's if, a combination of nature and nurture. Yes, Okay, so that's Bruce Lipton. Um, I've heard really good things about him from other uh, guests and just in my own research. Uh, the other thing I wanted to circle back to was uh, we were talking about di diabetes, and uh, uh, first it starts with hypo uh, being hypoglycemic, uh, or um, yeah, I think that's what you we were talking about. Hypoglycemia then can turn into uh, diabetes. Diabetic, yeah. Uh, state and where does this diagnosis or this label of pre-diabetic or pre-diabetes uh, fit into the equation great so what what's going to happen is you're you, you you it's a hypoglycemia is basically what you're asking me about is like how do we get you know 
on top of it quickly and go, oh my God, I'm hypoglycemic. This can get cascade and get worse. And if you have a good physician, if you're working with a good, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing, they can catch it early and give you the right recommendations to send the whole thing backwards, right? Because we know, I, I worked with Dr. Gabriel Cousins for 20 years and we know that diabetes type two is really a syndrome. It's not really a disease. It's just, you know, insult upon injury upon injury upon insult over and over. And eventually the kind cellular like a membranes- of a thousand cuts. Yeah, it's you know it's like that straw that finally gets you, and we, you've got to turn. Once you start getting the markers, you got to start pushing it back the other way. And one of the key ways to do that is to get the omega three in, and get your, and and also do a detox and cleanse and sponge your system out and get the glue out. Um, when we become conscious about food, as you have, I'm sure you realize like, oh, I'm not going to eat that. That food is like going to sit like glue, or it's going to stick to our ribs. And we have these phrases for a reason, right. and eventually we get we get glued up or we get calcified. And, and that what occurs is the sugar can't get into the cell. That's one of the major symptoms. And so it bounces out. So then we have to use insulin to bring that to control the blood sugar. And it, on an initial insulin response, there can be an overreaction. That's a hypoglycemia. But if there's an underreaction due to repeated overreactions, that's diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so eventually your body can't control the blood sugar. Is it possible to reverse diabetes? absolute diabetes type two yeah. and some types of type one in my experience, because I've known a couple people who've reversed type one, but I don't necessarily believe that type one is all one disease. It's probably 20 different conditions that are all lumped together and be called diabetes type one. Um, that's just a, it's kind of a simplification of what's really going on. It's an oversimplification. Diabetes type two is definitely a syndrome and can be reversed with lifestyle and, and diet in particular dietary changes. Right. Yeah. So what would be the, let's say the three most impactful things that somebody could do if they are diabetic uh, already, or maybe just pre-diabetic and at the, at the cusp of it potentially? Number one thing is get the omega-3 fatty acids in and stop the rancid omega-6 from coming in. So we've got, we've got to change the quality of oil that's coming into that person's body. And the, you know, avocados and olives and things that have natural monounsaturated fats and things that have natural saturated fats and also in particular the omega-3s are helpful, but I focus more on the omega-3. Next thing is then you got to do the tissue cleansing. That has a lot to do with bowel cleansing. So a lot of times when people get diabetic, they get backed up with waste and, and that will show up as excess weight. So we've got to get the weight off. And sometimes you can't get the weight off until you pull the plug out of the bathtub and that means bowel cleansing. And that means colonics and enemas and laxatives to just get things moving and get the lymph draining because your lymphatic system drains into your large intestine and that will come out as your quote unquote poop. So you might be eating a lot less, which I'd recommend for diabetics um, and get moving more to improve circulation, improve cellular respiration. Um, but it, until we pull that plug out and really drain and get the old feces out, metabolic waste out, we're in trouble. Another thing that's very helpful is certain types of supplementation, especially probiotics and enzymes. I'm a big enzymes fan. And, and I would say, of course, activated charcoal is excellent in the morning. I, my recommendation for people who really want to get into activated charcoal is instead of just taking it when you have an upset stomach, literally take it in the morning five, six, seven days a week, I do, and with water. And because, right, you know, you know, we were talking before about your friend who has a, um, oh, so Dr. Anthony the water filters. Jay, yeah. When, yeah. When I interviewed him, uh, we talked about activated charcoal and the importance of not drinking just water right out of the tap to, uh, have it go through activated charcoal filters to get all the, uh, estrogenic compounds out of it. Cause there's a lot of that that's in, in the water. And they don't filter that out. The the municipal water supply, it's great at getting like the big nasty bugs out, but the uh, estrogenic compounds not good at all. They don't even try. So that uh, that that was important uh, lesson I got out of that episode. I, but isn't I that interesting? Purely living spring water. I don't. Uh, yeah, we we don't drink tap water. So. So if we think about our body, you know, our body's a filter. It's a series of filter layers, right? You know, that's one way to understand all these tubes in our body. It's like, what are, what are we really doing? Like we have layers and layers and layers of filtration that don't allow things from our skin all the way in. There's 
an ability for a body to go, hey, that's stop, that molecule is too big or, or whatever. And carbon or charcoal is a really good thing to add into your own filtration system, which is your own body. And the best time to do that is in the morning. And again, there's no research on charcoal that indicates it absorbs healthy nutrients, which is a big, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions about charcoal. Every time I bring this up in front of an audience, almost everybody in the audience is like, well, what doesn't it absorb vitamin C or doesn't absorb protein or doesn't absorb healthy nutrients? And there's no evidence of that. 70 years of research of scientists trying to prove that activated charcoal absorbs healthy nutrients. So it's selective, which is very, very interesting. Now you'd think we've got a good scientific theory as to how it's selective. We do not. We do not. It's either, you know, depending on who you're listening to, they say, oh, it's pie stacking or Van der Waals forces or a combination of both. But even then, it doesn't explain how charcoal acts at a distance. Um, charcoal acts at a distance and as a purification element. So when you put charcoal through your body, it will pull all the toxins out of your whole system. And the idea is instead of just, you know, I really recommend doing a big cleanse at least once a year, usually twice a year. We do it at the end of the summer, at the end of the winter. Really good times to do cleansing. Um, but on the regular, you should have some charcoal in your diet because we've got, we're breathing on automobile fumes every day. We're breathing in all different, God knows how many chemicals you breathe in, you know, brake dust on a freeway. You know, from all the braking that's going on, those dust particles, that's like asbestos. It's like the worst. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we've got to protect our body with a constant something that filters like our liver does. Basically, we need another liver. Is there anything like that? And the answer is yes, it's activated charcoal. And the filtration mechanism in science is actually called interstitial dialysis. And we've that heard those terms. Very like, scientific. <laughs> right, but you go dialysis. I've heard that term before. By the way, when you go for dialysis and they're filled, you know, because some of these kidneys aren't functioning anymore, wh what are they using in that filter system? It's activated charcoal. Wow. That's what's in the dialysis machine. It's also, of course, in air purification systems as well. Right. So it's a good idea to just have some activated charcoal in your body in a toxic world that we live in. You know, it's not yeah, it's yeah. not the way it was ten thousand years ago. Yep. Okay. So. So that's all great advice. And uh, probiotics, any particular kinds of um, strains or uh, brands or anything that you recommend? One of the most important probiotics and the toughest, and probably if you're really in trouble with, with your microbiome, meaning that you don't really have a really good resistance in your friendly bacteria, easily overcome by unfriendly bacteria, is um, plantarum, L lactobacillus plantarum. So it's kind of like plant, A-R-U-M. That's one of the toughest strains of probiotics. And usually with the first one we go to when somebody's really in a lot of trouble, when they've basically done you know, years and years of antibiotics or, or had other issues that have disturbed their, their natural shielding, which is your friendly bacteria that live on your epithelial cells. So that's my recommendation. If you want to go to like some of the more interesting ones, Ruteri is an interesting one, R-E-U-T-E-R-E-I, -E -E I think is how you spell that one. Mm -hmm. That's one of the more interesting probiotics with, with a great history in front of it. And if you were going for formulas, my recommendation is to look into Dr. O'Hara's 35 years of probiotic research and his peer-reviewed literature, which is phenomenal. I actually got it as a book and read through the whole thing. And he, he experimented with combinations of probiotics, ending up with a 10-strain um, probiotic um, combination that he eventually put out. There's a Japanese research he put out there in, in Japan and finally made it over to America. It's called Dr. O'Hara's Probiotics. And uh, that's one of my favorites. Definitely the most powerful for the punch, in my opinion. You Meaning that you take two of those little gel cap things, you feel it. Most probiotics, you're kind of like, I don't know, did I really feel yeah, I anything? Feel anything I don't feel when I take probiotics. I, I don't. Um, and where where do pre, prebiotics fit into the picture? I, Very I, I, I bet some of our listeners haven't even heard of that term, prebiotic. Great term. Basically, prebiotic, I and mean, we think of the, of the lining of our intestines. Our, the lining of our intestines is like... It's the, it's like the matrix of the soil. It's, you know, they're metaphors of each other, right? The lining of our intestines is kind of like the soil. So when you think about like what makes that soil real healthy and what grows really well in that soil, it's roots. And so roots are filled with prebiotics, most famous of them being Jerusalem artichokes, 
which are great to grow as a garden vegetable. I really recommend it. Very, very tough in most ecosystems and abundant and produce a lot of food for you and come back year after year. So that one of those prebiotics is inulin. And inulin is a polysaccharide, a long chain sugar that can't really be totally eaten up by the probiotics. It can eat little pieces off of it. But the whole thing basically moves through you as a fiber, but gives that little bit of nourishment to those friendly bacteria so everybody's happy. So you don't get a blood sugar spike. You get inulin to your friendly bacteria, and it operates as a fiber, so it's a good broom that sweeps through you. Hmm. Nice. Okay. And um, how about spring water, the living spring water that you drink? I I get live spring water uh, from live spring water. <laughs> That's the company that Luke Story told me about. And, yes, you know, you, you know, I know that I know them. Well, I got them started on spring water. Oh, that's awesome! I, I, in, in our world, I'm pretty much at this point. I think the grandfather of the live spring water movement because I've been at it for so long and basically did lecture. I did thousands of lectures on it over the years online, in person, all over the world, and getting people to go to their local springs and check out what's going on, just to be a part of the phenomenon, just to see like, whoa, this water's coming out of the top of the mountain. Like, well, how's it coming out here? What's going on? How, you know, the spring water comes out colder than the ground temperature is. The ground temperature in Fahrenheit is usually between 56 and 58 degrees. The spring water could be coming out at 44 degrees. Right there, the ground next to it's 56. That spring water right there, three inches away, is 44 degrees. How can it, like, what I mean, diffusion, right? It's supposed to even out. The, you know, the cold, the warm moves into the cold, and the cold moves into warm, and it should be even. But it's not. It's an anomaly and an interesting scientific research project, for sure, which I've been on for 25 years. And I, I, do, I actually know now what's going on to some degree, but I don't get into that too much because then I'll get called, again, a pseudoscientist, which I don't want to get into that kind of stuff. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, a, it's a joy and a pleasure to investigate natural springs and drink the fresh water that comes from the earth filtered the way the earth does it yeah it's so it tastes so good too i have been drinking alkaline water for i don't know uh 10 years or so since uh i i heard about it from tony robbins went to unleash the power within and he espoused the benefits of alkaline water and also drinking uh water with uh with lemon uh, so that uh, it leaves a, an alkaline ash in, in your body, and so that's good for um, pre prevention purposes. But then after all those years of dr drinking alkaline water, I discovered through Luke this live spring water, and it tastes so much better than any of the other waters that I've ever had. It actually tastes good, and I, I was never really into drinking water now that's all I drink. I mean, I will have uh, the sparkling water like uh, Pellegrino as well, but it's mostly just live spring water. 90% uh, of the water I intake is live spring water, and then the other 10% is, is Pellegrino. And I avoid like the plague, any of the kind of bottled waters in, in, uh, in plastic. Try to avoid that because that plastic leaches into the water i forget how much microplastic I, I i've recently read something about the amount of microplastics that end up in in water from uh the the bottles it's it's shocking it is shocking it's scary i don't drink i mean no one would drink wine in plastic you know like let's let's respect water a little bit drink it out of glass if you're going to have it bottled but it's so cool what live spring water is doing getting that that glass water to you unpasteurized unfiltered and it's so wonderful to be able to go to the places in your own ecosystem. You know, when I'm in L.A., many, many years of doing lectures in L.A., talking about spring water, and everyone, of course, goes, oh, we don't have that here. Then to find out that right there, right at um, Wilshire Boulevard, Westgate, and Barrington, yeah, if you go down from Wilshire Boulevard down Barrington between Westgate and Barrington is one of the most ancient springs in California with an illustrious history that I never even knew about. It's on the uni high school campus do you know that place where i'm talking about you're from la yeah um, yeah I'm, I, okay I so, in Encino, so yeah okay so next time you're in santa monica and you're coming down wilshire boulevard like from the from the 405 yeah. go go on barrington south this is going to trip you out because everyone right there would be doing lectures down the street they say oh we don't have spring water here there's no spring water here this is what everybody says and then to find out there right there it is and has been all along 
right there. Now, not that I would drink that spring water there because there's so much buildings and stuff around it, but right. I have drank it. I'm still alive. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to see. So as you come down Barrington and just as you come down the hill and you'll see the school on your right side and the fences and stuff, I want you to look for the first side parking lot. Okay. You'll see it. There's a gate right there. And right there, if you look, pull the car over right there, you can park right there and just, if it's open, walk in there and you can see there's springs coming out right next to that parking lot, right there. That's crazy. And then if, you, if you're if you able to get in there, you know, sometimes they have it open. If you're able to go in, they have it all fenced off. Um, it's a Native American sacred site. If you get in there, there's spring water bubbling through the sand. It's totally incredible. It's totally incredible. But just it, to me, it's like so interesting the way that we go, oh, we don't have that somewhere else. But it's, it never is that. That's never true. It's always right in your backyard. It's just that awareness opening yourself up to the possibility that suddenly there it is. It's always been there. Oh, that's cool. One of my favorite little known places to, to go in that area, I, I go to Santa Monica all the time, like every weekend. There's uh, the, the metal meeting that I go to, the Self-Realization Center. Right, founded by uh, Yogananda, and uh, it's beautiful. It's such a uh, wonderful place to go visit and and just meditate or walk or read. Love that place. Have you been there? I love that place. There is, if you if you can track this down, ask next time you go. There's there's a cactus there. I think it's on the one that's in pa the Palisades, right? It's in Palisades, really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that I think was was Luther Burbank. Was that his name? He was the famous plant geneticist, and he and Yogananda prayed for this this um, cactus to lose its needles because like, you don't need these needles anymore. You just let them go. You you know they prayed over this cactus and it dropped its needles and it still grows there without any needles. Oh wow! So ask about that next time you're there. That's a neat little oh, that's a neat I little adventure. That. I love that. There's a great movie uh, documentary about Yogananda. It's called Awake. Have you seen that? I have not seen it. I'm oh. a huge Yogananda fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. I have not seen that. So you've read the book, the autobiography of Yogi? Twice. Okay. That <laughs> Maybe was, three I, times. I learned that that's the the one book that Steve Jobs would give to everybody. The, I have heard that. Yes, yeah. I have heard that over the years. In fact, somebody brought that up recently. Last time I was talking about that book, somebody said that Steve Jobs was a real fan of that book. And and I believe he was. I was, you know, Steve fan. Steve Jobs was a big fan of me. Actually, he was one of my first customers, and for many years, he would always he was a big patron of what we were doing, um, because we made those Arnold Errett books available, Mucus Society Healing System, and Rational Fasting, which he was a huge fan of. Those another huge fan of those books, by the way, is Woody Harrelson. All right. um, yeah, he really loves those books, and I do a lot of fasts with Woody Harrelson. Um, he's a really amazing guy. And, and by the way, I do want to say this about him. The reason why he is so successful is because he is one of the healthiest people in Hollywood. He's one of the people who stayed all, of all those years. Every year we do a fast. Every year we take time to cleanse. Every year we do you know, the, the whole cleansing system just to make sure that he can stay on that pace. Because a lot of years, people don't realize this, he's doing three movies a year. That's so hard to do. You know, that's like three or four months of shooting, and then you got another three or four months of shooting, and you got another three or four months of shooting. Different roles, different stuff. And it's like not all those films become big, you know, but he's there just grinding it out. I'm, I'm really I'm really amazed by him. You know, I've been friends with him for 20 years, and it's been interesting to watch him keep going because he has the stamina to keep going. Yeah, and he's so versatile. I, I just... I forget that you know his early career started with the Cheers TV show, and boy, he is just in such so different kinds of roles. Just uh, it's fascinating, yeah. Okay, so back to water for a moment. If you have to get water out of a container from the grocery store, do you have a favorite brand? Like my favorite is Castle Rock. Um, oh, I love Castle Rock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, and those guys, by the way, I think you know because the original founders of Castle Rock, not the current owners, and the current owners are great as far as I know, but I don't know them personally. But people have told me great things about them. Um, but the the guy who was um, he was the son in the era of Flora. Do you know Flora? No. It's a health food brand. They do a lot of flax oils and cool stuff. Anyway, the son he he came to many many of my events and he and I think I probably had something to do with getting him into spring water. 
Mm -hmm. So he started Castle Rock, and then he used to sh he used to come to all my events and, and have his water there for the event. So I'm very partial to him because he he really is an advocate from the with the right thing in, in mind and heart. But I, there are other great ones out there. I like um, it's another big one that I like. What's the one from? It has a orange orangish label. Looks like Pellegrino. It's 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 in glass anyway. I'm oh, trying to think. Um, it begins with a P. Is it Pellegrino? No, Pellegrino is the bubbly one. Yeah, Pellegrino. Uh, no, this. I, it's, uh, it's an Italian water. Yeah, I. Hold on, I'm gonna find. Yeah, it. yeah, see if you can find it. Anyway, that's another one that I'll get if I if I'm out, you know, caught in a pinch, and then I only buy spring water and glass. I never go for plastic. I mean, in fact, if I don't, if I, if it's only plastic, I'll go thirsty. Yeah, Aquapana. Aquapana, good, got it. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty good with this Google searching thing. I <laughs> kind of have a book on it. I yeah, yeah, you have it. a book. You know, Let's I've see your a, book. Look at this, look well, at this not beast. the big book. The big book is how to get your website to the top of Google. This is my little one. <laughs> oh, jeez. This is how to find anything on Google. So that's Google Power Search. Okay. Cool. Yeah, like confidential business plans of your competitors, that sort of stuff. Crazy what you can find. I found credit card number files with like expiration dates and everything. Crazy stuff. No, Crazy. That's not in the book. Uh, you won't okay. know how to do that from, <laughs> from okay. the book. I don't want to get I into trouble. that out like crazy. Okay, so Aquapana. Um, all right, so now let's go to like uh, rather than food intake, how about exercise? Like what are you doing that's innovative or that um, you've, heard, you've maybe been exposed to but not doing yourself but think uh, it's, it's worth exploring? Maybe some sort of interesting exercise regimen or some sort of uh, tool or device like, for example i just got the uh, carol bike i know dave asprey's uh big into this bike and and i just got one and i just interviewed the 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 co-founders uh it's it's an ai based uh bike kind of kind of everything that you would want in a peloton but in uh, and, and, and being able to do it in like 20 seconds of two hard out, uh, 20 second sprints, and then you're done with your workout for the day. Pretty wild. nice. So, well, I'm trying to point one out right here. It's behind me. It's a yoga swing. Oh, okay. You can see that. So you can get inverted in that, that yoga swing right there. That's my, one of my favorites. And you can see it has springs on the top of it. I don't know if you can see that in your image right there, but see those springs up there. Yeah. So when you get in there, it's kind of bouncy. So it's kind of a reverse rebounder. I'm a huge rebounder advocate, and I love trampolines. I have a trampoline in my yard for many yeah, years, I've and it goes it's out there in all the elements. It's great. I love rebounding. So whenever so I'm wait, caught, wait, like, wait, 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 before, before you you go in, into what you're about to talk about, why rebounding? Why is it so important? I know what the reason is, but I want our listener to understand. I love the way that it gently exercises every cell in your body, and so you have an increase of gravity, and then boom, you, you have that release into levity, and that increase in gravity and release into levity without shock, right? right. So I, I learned from injuries and many injuries of my life that I've been, I can't do, you know, for example, I can do push-ups, but I don't like to do them because it'll irritate this injury that I have right here. And if I keep doing more and more pushups, eventually I start having neck pain and other stuff. So I can't do normal things that people do, except I can do yoga, yep. which helps with that injury. And I can do this kind of stuff. And rebounding is really nice because you don't have the impact, you know, like running is an impact sport. Right. Um, you, it's, it's gentle. So you have that slow deceleration of the gravitational force and then, then a reversal and in, into the levitational force and then back to the gravitational force. So it's more gentle on every cell in your body and every muscle group in your body is activated by rebounding. Yeah. And it's also good for your lymphatic system because there's no pump there. Your circulatory system has the heart as a pump, but the lymphatic system just uses gravity. So if you're jumping on a rebound or, or trampoline you're getting that lymph moving around yes exactly that was the golden seven plus one that famous book on lymphocizing which really was one of the main books that popularized right out of la too popularized rebounding and trampoline jumping i mean that's what it you know rebounder is just a fancy name for a trampoline yeah, just a little we, you know, we, grew, <laughs> we, we grew up in the I, I guess we probably grew up in the 70s you grew up in the 70s yeah yeah 70s. We're, we're only a few months apart in age yeah Okay, yeah. So, you know, we called them trampolines back then, but they now we call them rebounders. But it stayed with me, so I'm really into that. 
And another thing that I'm really into that probably doesn't get enough press, so I'm going to give it some press right now, which is walking. Um, a lot of times I get up in the morning, I'll walk two and a half hours. Um, almost every morning I'll walk two and a half hours. And so I get up at five, walk until 730 and then and come back. And so in this neighborhood, it's really great because I can get out to different places every morning because I kind of get bored quickly with the same old stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think there's a name for the kind of yoga where it's got the the hanging stuff. Is it suspension yoga? Is that the name for it? Acro yoga. There's no, it's not acro yoga. It's um, it's not suspension yoga either. Oh, Jeez, aerial what is it? yoga. Aerial yoga. There it there is. There we go. Aerial so, yoga. Yeah, and Pretty it's cool. great too because you can really, you know, it's it's really fun for kids, and you know, this is that's what I love about these these little. Um, they're simple things, right? As soon as you get into the complicated exercise equipment, you know, kids not as fun for kids. So. When the kids are over, you can have them jumping on this thing and swinging and doing all kinds of stuff, and it's neat. That's awesome. All right. So, uh, any other um, kind of I don't know, environmental things that you want to share? Things that are in uh, or, or around the house, or that you go out to to experience to to keep your health uh, and, and longevity going. One of the things I really like to do, it's a big um, hobby for me, is to go to the, you know, the energy centers of the region where I'm at. Okay. Um, to, to, you know, so for example, let's say I'm in, um, I don't know, let's say I'm in Ontario, Canada. I'm going to go to the places where the spring water comes out and I'm going to get into the spring water in the winter and get into the ice cold water because spring water doesn't freeze. So where you have like a spring fed pond you will actually have an area pool and then it's frozen, you know, over the rest of the pond. But that area where the spring water is coming out is actually liquid. So you can get in even in the middle of the winter. And so, you know, those are like, that's like a power spot, right? Where a spring's coming out, there's something interesting happening. And what's cool about a spring is you can actually get into it. Yeah, It's kind of fun. So I'll always recharge doing those kinds of things, hiking to the tops of mountains. You know, when you think about a pyramid, you know, a pyramid has a point at the top of it. Mountains basically are like that too. And we know from research on electricity over the last 200 years that electrical charges will accumulate on edges, not on the side, on the edges, on the point. Like it's like a point of a steeple. You know, yeah. that's that's why they have, you know, an antenna at the top of the Empire State Building. So it takes the lightning. And that is also true with mountains and mountain tops. They have a higher amount of electrons or electricity that accumulate, you know, at the peak. So that might be the reason why people naturally, I like Paul Bragg myself, um, want to go up to the top of mountains to get, you know, there's something different about it. Something's happening up there. And, and I think that's what it is. It has something to do with the, the electron charge at the top of a mountain versus just on the side of the mountain or in a valley. Okay. Um, are you familiar with uh, ley lines? Yes, very familiar with ley lines yeah, so, and, uh, so and dowsing. What is it about ley lines that make make that special or important? There's something about energetic lines between places, and there's you know there's certain sometimes you're on a ley line. One of my favorite ley lines is the ley line right at the edge of the Berkeley Mountains in San Francisco Bay Area. You know, there's an area where you can see all the way across to Mount Tamalpais, or, or we call it Mount Tam on the other side. And native people always looked at that, you know, but you, it's not easy to get from one side to the other because you have to go through the San Francisco Bay, which is very rough in a canoe. And so they would always have to go all the way around. But there is this nice energetic line that connects you there. So there's a monastery right here on that spot at the very edge of that mountain range in Berkeley and the Berkeley Hills. And then over there is Mount Tam and it's magic. And, you know, there's so many amazing spots there and it's a ley line that connects those two and it was interesting you know that they they put the richmond bridge pretty much right on that ley line energetically and to me i you know i just it was that it was like a culmination of all those native people who always looked at mount tam but couldn't get there easily and now you can cross the richmond bridge and you're there in 15 minutes and to me that's a ley line it's an energetic connection that comes from our consciousness originally maybe it maybe it's geological too in origin but there we can't separate humans from the earth we try to do that in our philosophy and say oh if there was only no humans everything would be better or whatever but you can't separate humans from the earth we're intimately part of this earth and so our consciousness affects the earth yeah i believe that and how about sedona do you like sedona I love Sedona. Sedona is great. I wouldn't want to live there, but it's a great place to live because it's got these interesting energetic vortexes. And yeah. they are, interestingly, usually you wind your way up to the top of a, of a peak and some of them are smooth over the top, which are generally considered more feminine. I'm thinking of Bell 
what's the name of that one? Bell Mountain or something, I think is one of them in Sedona. And then some of them are more um, angular, which are considered more male and masculine energetically at the top. So, you know, there's, it's, there's something to it. Yeah, I enjoy I've, it. I felt it. I've, I, I felt the energy when I was there, but I felt, I, I'm pretty sensitive to the energy. Like I, whenever I go to the Kabbalah Center in, in LA, uh, I just like, it feels amazing. And then uh, the oneness uh, campus in uh, outside of Chennai in India, where the the big oh, cool. uh, temple yeah. is. Oh wow, Gosh. that is like intense. My wife had an out of body experience in, in, inside of that temple. It was amazing. It really is something. It's really there's something to it. You know, when you have uh, Machu Picchu to me is like that, where there's just amazing energy there, and you're like, what is the cause of this energy? You know, everyone would bring there, they go, this energy here is amazing. What is the cause of it? And I think it has to do with all those years of all those people who had lived there um, in with spiritual focus in mind. You know, because that's what they believe it really was. It was a it was a kind of a um, spiritual center. And where people could go, you know, like a monastery kind of vibe. Yeah. There's something to that. There's something, something to be said. You know, we, we discount the human effect on our environment in the, in the spiritual room. We know what the physical stuff looks like with the trash and all that stuff. Right. But there's a higher side. And there's the other side of the, of the issue, which is positive spiritual emanations and vibrations affects the environment and improves it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So one more uh, topic I wanted to briefly go over. Uh, well, maybe we can fit in two. Uh, I want to talk about the ozone machine that you get, you have there and how that can uh, help people. And then also I want to talk about chocolate. <laughs> okay, good. Um, ozone is just a tool for healing that I think it's really important that people just dig into the books on it. Ed McCabe's Flood Your Body with Oxygen is the definitive tome on the subject, giving you a broad spectrum of the power of oxygen therapies and how important oxygen is. We know oxygen is important. Everybody knows that, but geez, why don't we use it more? So I got really, I was just trained by doctors early on. I was very lucky that I got a very good education early on in how to use ozone. And I've used ozone in my house for, you know, 25 years. So I'm really into it. And I've done every kind of ozone therapy every time. Like in my good friend um, Lisa in, in Calgary has a really wonderful ozone center there. I was just there. And so, I, you know, right before getting on a flight, you get ba you get dosed up in oxygen. So I did in her, in that case you sit in a sauna, and the ozone's going into the sauna. So it's basically helping your body get oxygenated right around from the skin because our skin breathes right. and it needs oxygen. It needs like reactive oxygen and, it's and our biggest reactive. Organ. It's our biggest organ. So that's part of what we do. And then I did an ozone big glass of ozonated water there, and then I did an ozone enema there, and then took off for my flight. Oh wow. Um, so that's kind of what some of the neat stuff you can do with ozone. You can't breathe the ozone directly, though. No, you cannot breathe it directly because it's it's too aggressive. Because the ozone is an oxygen O2 that's had an extra electron or basically an extra oxygen attached to it. So it's O3 or O4 or O5 or O6 or O7 or O8 or O9 or even higher. And basically, you can't breathe the aggressive O3, O4, O5, O6, O7. It's mm. too aggressive. So if you want, you can breathe it if you bubble it through olive oil. And there's ways to you know get around that. You also probably, if you're going to do an ozone enema, should bubble it through water, which is what Lisa does at her place because ozone is also very dry. And so bubbling it through water hydrates it. So then it goes into your colon and actually your colon tissue is very similar to lung tissue. Uh, most cancer doctors know that because colon cancer typically spreads to lung cancer because the tissue is almost the same. Mm. And it's a way of oxygenating yourself. It's very interesting. So that's worth investigating. Now on chocolate, um, as you know, I think you know that I'm a chocolate grower and have yeah. been for yeah, at least yeah. 15 I've, years I, and, I, and a vanilla grower. Yeah. So your sacred chocolate uh, brand that you're as associated with is really amazing. And uh, it's, it's, it's really pristine stuff. Uh, can you describe what is different about your chocolate versus every other chocolate out there? <laughs> well, one thing that I, I do that's very unusual and rare in the world, I, I doubt you'd find anybody else who does this in the world. I'm a soil to bar guy. So we grow the chocolate all the way from the soil. I mean, meaning we sprouted those trees. We grew them all the way from cacao seeds, you know, from cacao beans, fresh, all the way to trees, all the way to, you know, incredible producing um, chocolate, you know, factories, you know, because each one of those trees, each pod is going to produce somewhere around three, four, five chocolate bars, 
right? So each, it's like really, you know, you're growing chocolate bars essentially, and then those are going to get prepared in our kitchen, and then they'll ship, be shipped to our chocolate factory where they're turned into chocolate bars or or other, you know, chocolate type of products. Sometimes we turn them into powders, and sometimes we turn them into paste, and sometimes into chocolate butter. Um, but we're the only operation that does that soil to bar, hmm. which is really awesome. So. If you and we also produce our own vanilla and our own honey and many other ingredients that go into our chocolate, which is which is very fun. Because oh, chocolate cool. is really homegrown chocolate is is to me the it's like probably my biggest success in life. It's a you know to go for, right. Oh, it's the okay. So I have a good friend of mine, Ramiz Saad, who is a analytical chemist in Toronto, and for many years he tested all our food. You know for trace minerals, especially the 17 rare earth elements. And he, he repeatedly came back to me. He's like, cacao contains the rare earth elements. So let me give you a quick list of what those are, the foods that contain them based on his research in the lab. Um, cacao or chocolate. And that's why chocolate is such a longevity food. Chocolate's number one longevity food for a human being. You know, the longest lived people in the world are chocolate eaters. So number one is chocolate. Number two, green tea. Number three, interesting, black cumin. You know, black seed oil, very popular in Islamic countries and, and also in very popular in Israel and basically in the Middle East, um, black seed oil. And, and that contains the rare earth elements. Another one was turmeric. Turmeric contains the rare earth elements, interestingly. Hmm. So that's really a shocking, another amazing thing that was like, oh, my God, we better be eating turmeric. Um, and another thing that was interesting, there was cinnamon. Cinnamon contains the rare earth elements as well, but you have to get the right kind. I, I recommend the Sri Lankan or Zelanicum um, cinnamon. That's also tested to have the most rare earths in it, and it tastes the best too. So that's something to look for. If you're looking for cinnamon, make sure you get the good kind. And then what else was on that list? Another one that was on the list, interestingly, not really a food but can be used herbally, is pine needles. Oh, really? Pine needles also contain rare earth elements, which is very interesting because pine pollen is commonly used as an anti-aging substance in Chinese medicine, and we we consume it. We consume a lot of pine pollen. It tastes good. It's really good. You know when you you know in the like usually in California it's in March, late March you hit the tree. You know you hit a branch of a palm or of a pine tree, and it, all of a sudden this yellow stuff comes out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's you can eat that, and it's good. Oh, wow. And we that's pine pollen, and it's anti-aging, and so you know that's. That's another one, and there was one more he had in his list. It was it was a fascinating research study that he did on these rare earth elements, but they're not common in the food supply. They are not common, but his position, interestingly, is that the rare earth elements are important for enzyme production in your body. So enzymes have a correlation. You know, if you're the older you are, the less enzymatic activity you have in your body, and you always want to do anything you can to increase enzymatic activity in your body. That's one of the reasons why you do probiotic bacteria or, or fermented food, cultured food, get more of that enzymatic activity happening. And uh, one of the ways to do that is get more of the rare earths into your body. Got it. Cool. And uh, speaking of the enzymes, you mentioned uh, probiotics and enzymes in the same sentence uh, a, a while back. And we talked about what are some of your favorite probiotics, but we didn't talk about what were some of your favorite enzymes as, as supplements. Oh, you great. You want um, to recommend? Well, I have my own, which is okay. sold out right now. Um, so I always have they're my longevity enzymes. And then I really like some of these designer enzymes like serapeptase that's designed to get the fibrin out of your system. If you have a fibrin related, related condition, there's very specific enzymes you can go after. Natokinase, if you've had heart trouble and a history of heart trouble, you can go after natokinase. That's another interesting enzyme. I like some of these enzyme formulas like Wobe enzyme, which is very popular in Europe and has a tremendous research history. W-O-B enzyme, Wobe enzyme, very interesting. Um, I really like the research of Max Gerson and his research on liver enzymes. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat liver. But if someone had a serious cancer diagnosis, I think Gerson's strategy for using liver enzymes to chew through and eat the cancer hmm. has, has been a, a very valuable and valid angle for cancer and has led to many remissions. Um, what else? I mean, I could go on about enzymes. I'm really into it. Another one that I like to do a lot of is the um, – you usually about five proteases all mixed together, and that's that's essentially as a vegetarian enzyme as close as I'm going to come to liver enzymes. Okay. You know, it's 
it's not quite as powerful, but it's as close as I'm going to get. So I like those. So they're called Protease 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And they, they have their own history and interesting research behind them. So are those uh, that you get at a particular uh, health food store from a particular brand or those proteases, one, two, three, four, five? Yeah, yeah, you have to hunt around. The last time I was at it, I went to see a naturopath in Calgary, actually, when I was there. I was doing a water fast, actually. So I went to go get a, um, a, a Myers cocktail, which is an IV of B yeah. vitamins, you know, and you know what that is. And, uh, and, I was, and so I was walking around and I saw these, all these enzymes you had. I was like, yeah, tell me what the best enzymes in this group are. And so I, he, he said this one. And when I pulled it out, boom, it was the ones with the five different proteases in it. And I bought them and they were pretty expensive. It was like $90, but I got a lot of enzymes for it. And I wasn't, you know, I was on a fast, so I wasn't eating food anyway. So I was like, let me put my money into something that can accelerate my healing. And I do these fasts and cleanses twice a year, as I mentioned. I think that's really important. And I do lead those fasts and cleanses with people from all over the world. So we will do it virtual where we have a call that starts on day one, and then we have a call at the end of week one, and then a call at the end of week two. So three calls, and then we're checking in every day on on uh, communications app and seeing how we're all doing. And we usually have a couple hundred people, and it's really fun, oh, wow. and it's easy to do it as a group. Yeah, how do you it's really uh, where, where do you uh, sign up for that? <laughs> it's it's like you know if you're on my if you ever get to my site davidwolf.com and you just want to be on my email list, we'll alert you when that time comes around. The next one will be in March. It'll come around March. I don't know, 15th or something like that, we'll start getting the thing going. But we'll obviously advertise it before that. And Woody Harrelson has agreed to do that one with us. So oh, nice. I'm going to try to drag him onto a call. Um, he was, one time we were doing a, a cleanse and he was behind the camera. He doesn't like to, you know, he when he's off work, he doesn't like to do any kind of, you know, film or video or whatever. But he does like to advocate that people get healthy. He really is a big advocate of cleansing and health. And so I was able to get him behind the camera and be like, you know, come on, you know, I think I'll be able to drag him in front of the camera and just have him give him a, have him show a cameo on our next cleanse because he really, he's a big advocate of this strategy of lifestyle, which is cleanse, detoxify, get more energy, feel better, feel healthier, feel brighter, and then, and then get, you know, then get out there and, and kick some butt and then, uh, then cleanse again. Yeah. You know, when, when you poured it all on like that. Yeah. I did my first cleanse in Fiji at uh, the Life Mastery event, which uh, was, you know, was one of Tony Robbins' events. And he doesn't teach it anymore, but uh, uh, his team teaches it. And you cleanse the whole time. You don't eat any food. That's so end. great. Yeah. Yeah. And just to everyone listening to that, I know that sounds tough and I know that sounds like a load. You're like, what do you mean you don't need any food? But it's, we take you in step by step. I've worked this out over the years. It takes three weeks. And so the first week we get you down to one meal a day. You can do the rest liquids, but you gradually bring your calories down and we coach you on that through that week. And then the second week, it's all liquids and we gradually bring those calories down through that week. And then boom, right on that third week, we're ready to start the water fast. And it works. It works. As long as you work that system and do what we're doing every day, because we work this out. I mean, I've been doing this 25 years. You figure out like, okay, what's going to work? What's not? You can't just jump into a water fast. It's not safe. Yeah. Not yeah, only that's that. True that I, uh, I, I, now that I remember from Fiji, we started with eating just like uh, salads and, and then it graduated into uh, the, 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 the water fast or actually it was a, more of like a, a, a juice fast, not, not juice fast. It was like a, what was it? We had little um, things of uh, Udo's oil, Udo's oh, you guys oil, did Udo's oil. Yeah. with a uh, a little tiny slice of pineapple. With it, that was like we were so excited because when we got that, and the rest of the time was water. <laughs> it's like, yay, we get That's to have great. our little Udo's oil for the day. Uh, yeah, that was that was actually very energizing. I felt uh, invigorated from that. It's it's a shock to most people. You know, you get deep into a, into a cleanse, and then you know you, you'll come to that day, and you'll be, most people would just say, "Hey, it's two weeks." But when you get to that day of the first day of the water fast, I find that a lot of people just go, "You know what? The heck, I've gone this far anyway. Let me just try it." And next thing you know, it's three days later, and they're still on it. Next thing you know, they're like, "I did my first week long water fast ever in my life. I've never." You know, these are people who've never done a single day of water fasting, because everything is about strategy, right? Everything is about strategy. You you, you can't just go. I'm going to go out and make money, you know, and just walk out the door. You have to have a strategy. You can't go, I'm going to go out and be healthy and just like walk out the door. You got to have a strategy. And it's just like that with cleansing too. You have to have a strategy. But when you have the right strategy, it works. It's easier. And so you're not battling 
you know, you've built the momentum step by step by step by step, and then you're ready. Your body's ready. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. My, my favorite quote about strategy is from The Art of War. Sun Tzu wrote, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Ooh. Good quote. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at time. Thank you so much, David. For that was great. That was great. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for being so forgiving. And, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. And uh, life-changing, too, if you actually apply this stuff, listener. <laughs> you need to apply it. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>